So I'm gonna try something a little different tonight. I was asked to give a talk on lipedema and Durkheim's disease because the Fat Disorders Research Society supports all adipose tissue disorders and the most common ones are lipedema and Durkheim's disease. And uh, this year actually, it was formally published a paper that an undergraduate student and I, Karen Beltran, wrote on the differences between lipedema and Durkheim's disease because I personally have trouble distinguishing sometimes whether somebody is pure Durkheim's disease or someone is pure lipedema or if they have a mixture of both. And um, in our group, uh, we call um, women who have pure lipedema perfect. And we call women who have Durkheim's, pure Durkheim's disease perfect. So I um, just want all you guys to know out here that you're all perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and you want you uh, on, uh, online as well. So. I also wanted to participate with you, and so I wanted to do an online survey, and I've never done an online survey um, at the same time, and we have to switch back and forth between online and my PowerPoint slides, and the guys in back let me know it might be a little rough. So please bear with me, have patience, and I'll go ahead and move forward. So here are my disclosures. Um, I am on the FDRS medical board. And I also am funded by the Lipedema Foundation, and as you heard from Cheyenne, they funded the TREAT program. And I have um, two of my team members here tonight. Chris Ussery is in the back there. And then um, through my clinic, I met a young woman named Mary Sevier, and I needed help doing the diagnosis, um, the hands-on nodular lipoma assessment, and um, I taught Mary, and she's, um, we have another study going on in the community, and she actually participated in that, and she came to my clinic, and she's worked really, really hard to be able to diagnose patients with Durkheim's disease and lipidema, so I'd like to give you a hand, Mary, and thank you. So just really quick, uh, we'll talk more about the TREAT program later, but um, we really wanted to collect a biorepository of samples, not to hoard for ourselves, um, but to use ourselves and to share with collaborators. And we have completed two agreements with collaborators. We have consented over 240 people. We have hundreds of samples of blood and skin and fat. Um, both frozen and in formalin, and we're very excited to, to, um, to give out those samples to investigators who are top-notch in their field to try and figure out Durkheim's disease and lipedema as quickly as we can. We also are going to roll out a CME for healthcare providers on September 30th, and uh, we're doing that in collaboration with Dr. L. Ross at the University of Arizona. So there is actually a, a physician in the audience. Her name's Tina Bonner. I met her at UCSD. She uh, had a patient with Durkheim's disease, and she's become very interested in fat disorders. She um, left UCSD, and a lot of people were unhappy, because I had, and I was too. I had no one to send patients to. But she's moved to Idaho, and she's here tonight, and she said, I want to um, take care of patients with lipedema and Durkheim's disease. So yay, Tina. And so we'll be training more on September 30th, so, so stay tuned, and we're getting it all set up. And then we're doing imaging, and uh, there is also another provider here who is an expert in MRI. Her name is Shelly Krasinski from Vanderbilt, and she's already um, got a publication out on imaging for lipedema, and it's under review, it's my understanding, right, Shelly? Yay, congratulations, Shelly. So um, our, the aim of the TREAT program is to study both lipedema and Durkheim's disease to find a cure, and we have not left out the other fat disorders. Um, because what we feel is that if we learn more about one fat disorder, it's going to benefit the other fat disorders. And if you go to the FDRS website, you're going to see the, I think Cheyenne showed it, the overlapping circles. All of the fat disorders have things in common. So we hope whatever we learn about lipidema and Durkheim's disease, we're going to spread the love to the other fat disorders. So you are not forgotten. So if you wouldn't mind going to your cell phones right now, if you would like to participate, if you don't want to participate, that's fine, no problem. 
and anyone streaming it can go online as well and participate. And you want to go to the website, kahoot.it, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. And once you're there, just hang tight, and we will, I'll let you know when we're going to start to play. So here's the four uh, fat disorders that are supported by the FDRS and by me and by the TREAT program. Lipedema is the most common. Then there's Durkheim's disease. Familial multiple lipomatosis or familial multiple angiolipomatosis and Madelung's disease. So, the question I have about lipedema and Durkheim's disease, there are different types of Durkheim's disease, but for the type of Durkheim's disease that's similar to lipedema, are we comparing apples to apples? So is it really the same disorder, just a different expression, or are we actually comparing apples to oranges? All right, I think we can go ahead and start. So, Durkheim's versus lipedema. Which disorder do you have? You have 20 seconds to answer. Do you have lipedema, Durkheim's disease, familial multiple lipomatosis, or Madelung's disease, also known as MSL? So, Durkheim's disease looks like it's red, lipedema's blue, familial multiple lipomatosis is yellow, and Madelung's disease is in the green. All right, so here's the answers. We have 38 with lipedema, 18 with Dirk, 39 with lipedema. I feel like I'm auctioning. 39. 39 with lipedema, 18. So the so majority of it is, but Durkheim's disease is catching up. A uh, majority of, of uh, people um, have lipedema. So it, it's kind of nice to know who you're sitting amongst, right, in your audience. Um, so it looks like um, the majority is lipedema, but Durkheim's is not far behind. Okay, so next. So um, go ahead and answer which one of these ladies you think has Durkheim's disease. Does Lady A have it? Does Lady, or lipedema, lipedema. Does Lady A have it? Does Lady B have it? Or do they both or do, do neither? So A is, okay. So the majority felt um, that Lady B has lipedema. So if we could go back to my PowerPoint presentation. So um, the lady um, A is from a, a very old publication in 1909, and she is described as having Durkheim's disease, not lipedema. Lipedema wasn't even known back in 1909. It was first described in 1940. But as you can see, she has those classic stovepipe legs similar to this lady who has lipedema. Um, but she's, you can see she's in agony, she's in, in a lot of pain. She's also got large upper arms, similar to ladies who have lipedema. So in my opinion, both of these ladies have lipedema. It's just that lady A has gone on to progress and develop more pain and also more signs and symptoms of Durkheim's disease. So I would say both lady A and B have lipedema. So there are different types of Durkheim's disease, and this is what makes it very confusing for providers, including myself, to actually formally diagnose a patient with Durkheim's disease. And I would like to introduce the term lipoobesity. And to me, this is a combination of lipedema plus obesity. And as we all know, obesity is pretty rampant throughout the world. It's very difficult to have lipedema without obesity. So when you develop obesity, you tend to become insulin resistant and you develop metabolic syndrome or prediabetes or diabetes. So I believe that lipoobesity is lipedema and metabolic syndrome. So it's a woman who becomes obese. She can even develop some lipomas. She gets more pain and she gets more signs and symptoms of Durkheim's disease and she can even go on to develop lymphedema. And a couple years ago when I went to Sweden, they saw the exact same pattern. And a couple years before that, when I met Birger Fager, who was an expert on lipedema and actually worked with Hakan Brorsen from Lund, Sweden, he also said the same thing that he believes that many women, when they gain excess fat on their body, that's sick fat, then they can develop signs and symptoms of Durkheim's disease. And then there's the diffuse Durkheim's disease, where there are small nodules all over the body. Now, in lipedema, we 
usually think that lipidema affects the legs, my, my big legs, my heavy legs, but the arm is also affected. What tends to be spared early on is the trunk, not the breasts, <laughs> but the trunk. So the, the uh, anterior ribs, uh, the back, and usually the upper part of the abdomen. In Durkheim's disease, I hear this over and over. A woman will say, my first lipoma was on my chest. Or the worst part for me are my ribs. I have these small nodules all over my ribs. I can't bend over, I can't breathe. That is different from Durkheim's disease, or from lipedema. So for me, that helps me distinguish between the two. And the small nodules in Durkheim's disease can be anywhere on the top of the head all the way to the bottom of the foot. And to find them on the bottom of the foot, I bend the foot back and hold it, and sometimes I push a little bit, and then the little lipomas tend to pop out. There's also the nodular Durkheim's disease, and I, we saw a couple of those today uh, in our research program. And the nodular type are the larger lipomas. They're marble size, they're the size of the walnut, they can be the size of a fist. They tend to occur on the arms, the chest, especially the low back, the flanks, the abdomen, and the thighs. Less commonly below the knee, and less commonly on the feet, the hands, or the head. And then there's a mixture between the two where you can have larger lipomas, and then you can have the diffuse nodules all over the body. So we have the three types that I've been talking about for quite some time, and then we need to add in this fourth type of women with lipedema who go on to develop signs and symptoms of Durkheim's disease. And this is just a, a cartoon of, of how I'm thinking of Durkheim's disease. And um, on this one, the first one, you can see that this person has angiolipomas. So I drew these painful large lipomas all over the body and the little red squiggles in there are blood vessels. And we are seeing more and more angiolipomas than I would have imagined in Durkheim's disease. And angiolipomas are very painful because they have fibrin clots in them. The vessels are clotted off and then they die. So anyone who has angiolipomas, and I know there's one in this audience because I examined her today, they have dead tissue within each and every angiolipoma on their body. So they have what we call nodular Durkheim's disease, but really they have angiolipomatosis. And so we're starting to now pick apart the different types of Durkheim's disease, which I think will help us better differentiate from lipedema and also figure these things out and find a cure. The second uh, picture here is of a person who has multiple lipomas. They're painful, but they're not angiolipomas. When you get them biopsied, you send them down to the pathologist, and the pathology says mature adipose tissue uh, consistent with a fat or a lipoma. And I'm sure some of you have had your lipomas taken out. And they say, oh, it's just a lipoma. They, those don't hurt. So that's, that's also nodular Durkheim's disease. So you can see how it's starting to get confuse, confuse, confusing. Uh, and multiple angiolipomas and multiple lipomas, we're both calling nodular Durkheim's disease, but I think that they are different. And then you have the diffuse Durkheim's disease, which I'm showing as very small, painful nodules on the body. And again, they can, I didn't show it, but they can occur on the head, they can occur on the bottom of the foot, they can even occur on the hands. And then you have your mixed Durkheim's disease, larger painful lipomas and small diffuse nodules. So this is a picture of an angiolipoma on the left and a, a normal adipose tissue on the right. So in the normal adipose tissue, you see that the, those uh, empty holes, I guess, are fat cells or adipocytes. And you can see they're right up against each other. There's really no spaces between them. There is a large vessel down here on the bottom. Say on this side, you can see it over here. Large vessel down here on the bottom. Otherwise, it's really hard to see these teeny tiny little capillaries that are in the fat tissue. And each fat cell is supplied by one or more capillaries. But in this angiolipoma, look how enlarged those vessels are. They're big. And you can see red in them. Those are the red blood cells carrying oxygen in those vessels. But there's a lot of them in there. And I also want to point out that in, in some of uh, the areas of the fat here, you can see these teeny tiny fat cells. Those little fat cells have died. 
they are no longer viable. And especially right here, this is not viable tissue. Let's see if I can show it over here. Right here, this is not viable tissue. That's a piece of dead tissue right in the middle of that angiolipoma. If we look closer into the angiolipoma, and this is from a woman who has a nodular Durkheim's disease, but her, her legs felt very much so like, um, like uh, lipedema, like an advanced stage lipedema. She had masses throughout, and I did not think she had angiolipomas until we biopsied her, and this is what we found. And you can see uh, that there is a, a bunch of blood vessels here, and those you know, little red uh, circles are red blood cells flowing through the vessel. But what's different about these blood vessels are they have these fibrin clots. And you can see these kind of clearish, whitish areas here. Those are clots within the vessels. And your blood vessels are not supposed to have clots in them. They're supposed to allow blood to flow freely. When you have a clot, then you can actually cut off blood supply, right, to a leg. That, that clot can actually be thrown and go into your lungs or into your brain and kill you, right? So it, clots are not good. And you can see this tube here. That tube used to be a blood vessel. It's now empty. It's no longer functioning. It is dead. And in that tube is an eosinophil. And an eosinophil is an immune cell, and it's a marker of chronic inflammation. So there's chronic inflammation inside angiolipomas. There are dead blood vessels in there, and there are clots. None of that is good, right? So if you are killing off your blood vessels, are you getting good oxygen supply? No, so you're getting poor blood flow through those angiolipomas. No wonder they hurt, right? What we haven't shown here is that angiolipomas also contain mast cells. Mast cells are another kind of immune cell, and mast cells are like tanks. They shoot out majorly big bombs of, of all kinds. They do a lot of damage to tissue, and they also make you itch and flush. So anyone with angiolipomas has itching and flushing and a whole bunch of other signs and symptoms of Durkheim's disease. Isn't that interesting? So I'm going to talk more about angiolipomas tomorrow. So now I want to move on to lipedema. We talk about lipedema in stages. I'm going to just say right out loud, I don't like the staging because I don't feel like if you're a lady with stage two lipedema that you have to worry about when you're going to become a three. Or if you're a three, when are you going to, be, when are you going to become a four? And you're going to become a four, right? That's just, that, I don't like to think of it like that. I'd love to change the names. Maybe the FDRS will help with that. Um, but also I wanted to point out with stages, are we only talking about fat tissue? When we refer to stages, what really are we describing? The skin, right? Skin. It's all about the skin. So when we talk about lipedema stages, we're talking about lipedema skin. So we have to remember that lipedema skin is super important in lipedema. And when we do our biopsies, we don't just make a slit in the tissue and take the fat. We actually take a piece of the skin because the skin tells us so much about the lipedema. So in stage one, the skin is really smooth over nodular fat tissue, right? That's how we, we diagnose lipedema. You've got to feel those pearl-sized nodules. So when you talk to your doctors, remember how we say like, someone said rice and peas today. I like that. I liked rice and peas. But I also think that, you know, every, you, all of you are perfect. Remember that? and you have pearls in your tissue. So you're full of pearls. So in stage one, it's smooth, but you've got those nodules or rice and peas underneath or the pearls. In stage two, the skin is starting to be pulled down into the fat tissue because it's become fibrotic and the fibrotic bands are thickening and contracting. But again, it's the skin is, is what we're using to do a diagnosis for the stage. You've also got larger masses in the fat tissue. So now instead of just little pearls, you also find nut-like or nut-sized masses are larger. And then in stage three, you're starting to get lobules of fat, folds in the, in the fat tissue. And so the skin, right, is, is growing and pouching out and with the fat underneath it. And it's starting to uh, cause deformations in the tissue. So. For patients who have lipedema, who is more likely to have hypermobility? So hypermobile joints or flexibility or Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility. 
Would it be a woman with Durkheim's disease? Would it be a man with Durkheim's disease? Would it be women with lipedema? Would it be men with lipedema? And I bring this up because today we've been looking at people uh, and examining prim primarily women who have uh, lipedema and Durkheim's disease, and there's a lot of hypermobility in this audience today. So who is more likely to have hypermobile joints or flexibility or Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility? Is it women with Durkheim's disease, men with Durkheim's disease, women with lipedema, or men with lipedema? And by the way, that's my hand. <laughs> this is a hard one, so just give it a guess. So, there is kind of split, so between women with Durkheim's disease and women with lipedema. And that, you know, very good choice because uh, as women, and, as young girls and young boys go through puberty and they both have hypermobility, the girls are going to show more signs and symptoms of hypermobility than the boys. So that was actually correct in picking the women. Can we go back to my presentation? So who's more likely? So we did a study, uh, again, this was uh, Karen Beltran and myself looking at hypermobility, and we found that even though in this particular study of women with lipedema, women with Durkheim's disease, and men with Durkheim's disease, shown as that DD, women with lipedema were larger, so they had a higher weight and a higher BMI. Um, they had more hypermobility than the women with Durkheim's disease or the men with Durkheim's disease. So it's actually women with lipedema who are more hypermobile. And also on the bottom there, I just uh, showed that women with uh, Durkheim's disease are more likely to have diabetes compared to women with lipedema, despite women with lipedema having more weight and a higher BMI, which is interesting. This is a... Um, a Another way we looked at it, we said, okay, if women with lipedema are more likely to be hypermobile, how do they compare to patients who are, are, are a mixture between lipedema and Durkheim's disease? And we found that they were more likely to have hypermobility than the mixture uh, between lipedema, lipedema and Durkheim's disease or Durkheim's disease alone. And that's published, and so you can look that up. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm back on hypermobility. Uh, I think um, I heard that Dr. Frank Amano was going to be here during the conference, and she's an expert on Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility. And so um, I think it's great to have an expert um, interested in the lipedema population and the Durkheim's disease population because of the hypermobility. So this is the next question. Who's more likely to be hypermobile? A woman with stage one lipedema, a woman with stage two lipedema, a woman with stage three lipedema, or women with stage two and three? Okay, stage one, two, and three, or two and three together. And that's a woman who has, uh, she's got lip stage two, three, bending over and showing us her hip flexibility. Two, one. Time's up, and Woohoo! You guys are smart. <laughs> so the correct answer is women with stage two and three lipedema. So uh, we showed that women with stage two or three lipedema were more likely to have hypermobility than women with stage one lipedema. And you can see that we had a pretty good number of uh, subjects in the study. So we had 48 who had stage three, 79 who had stage two, and 26 that had stage one. But I think you can also see if we had more people, it would probably end up that women with stage three are, are at the greatest uh, risk for um, hypermobility compared to stage two and stage one. And when you're hypermobile, your joints have um, greater flexibility than they should have. And so you're at risk for damage to the joints. And how did they get that flexibility? Well, well, the flexibility is in the connective tissue. It's in the tendons. It's in the fascia. And what are your blood vessels made out of? Connective tissue. So if you have a problem with in connective tissue in your joints, you're likely also to have a problem in the connective tissue of your blood vessels. If your blood vessels are kind of a little floppy and when they get a rush of blood, they dilate and they leak a lot more into the tissue, what has to work harder? your lymphatics. And if you keep spilling more fluid in and your lymphatics start working and your, 
you're going in this big cycle, pretty soon those lymphatics start to form aneurysms, and they get weak, and they leak, and you're at risk for lymphedema. And in fact, in this study, we showed that almost all the women who had stage four, so who had developed lymphedema, were hypermobile. Okay, back to the Kahoot program. How many of you have that upper inner thigh fat? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's that lobe of fat in the upper inner thigh. How many of you have that? So next. So it's yes or no. You either have it or you don't. Okay, so that's pretty well represented in both groups, but it seems like uh, more women are, have that upper inner uh, thigh fat lobule than, than not. Can we go back to my presentation, please? So I've been thinking about this, and what I notice is that we talk a lot about the thigh. The thigh has a lot of different parts, and I'm calling them zones, a lot of different zones. There's the, the front zone, which tends to be kind of really thick fat, but then there's that inner zone, which tends to have that loose kind of floppy fat tissue that once you get it, you realize that you have it and you know you don't want it. And then there's that outer part here that tends to get super lumpy and super nodular. And then you've got the back part of the thigh that gets those linear ripples on it, right? And then you've got the back of the knee. And then you've got that wonderful little pouch under the knee. And then you have that ankle cuff. So there's all these different zones. I gave them different colors. I marked them one through seven. And my question is, if you have changes in zones two and three, is that the same as a change in zone one? What is making those different parts of the thigh so different? And if we look at the inner part of the thigh, you can see that there's a lot of stuff there. There are deep inguinal lymph nodes, so there's a lot, of, a lot of lymph nodes there. There's also these large vessels. You've got large veins. You've got large arteries. So it's a super, super vascular area. So when you develop a pouch there, it can mean one of two things. One, you're, you're having problems with your vasculature, or two, you've got hypermobile skin that when you leak, it just can't contain it, and it starts to stretch and form a pouch. On the back part of the knee, you can see that um, it's also a very vascular area. It's got this large vein running um, down the back of the leg, and I'm sure our vascular um, surgeons in the audience know this a lot better than I do. But you've also got a, a lot of lymph nodes there in the popliteal. So I was talking to Shelly about this today, and I would like to zone out the leg and get down to the nitty gritty differences and see if we can't figure out how we can um, further differentiate lipedema and Durkheim's disease so it becomes less of a problem. So we would like to develop a phenotype assessment based on not only visualization of the tissue, but we want more hands-on and we want more tools to help us assess the different zones of the tissue and we want to correlate that with the underlying soft tissue structures. And we really need help identifying genes that will help us tell the similarity, sim similarities and differences between lipedema and Durkheim's disease. And we want to understand the cell and tissue physiology that makes them similar and different. So this is uh, the paper going into a little bit more nitty gritty on the paper. Uh, we uh, looked at 159 women and one man with lipedema and 79 women and 15 men who had Durkheim's disease. And then there were 18 where they had a mixture of lipedema and Durkheim's disease, and they were all women. They were all around the same age, about 50. They were all about the same height. Women with lipedema tended to weigh more than patients with Durkheim's disease or those who had <laughs> lipedema and Durkheim's disease. Women with lipedema also had a greater BMI, as I mentioned. Blood pressure was no different between any of the groups, and some of um, the, the patients were on treatment. This is primarily a, a Caucasian, so a European population, um, with very few people of Hispanic heritage, and we are trying to change that. And the most common lipedema stage in this population was stage two. 
and the most common type of Durkheim's disease was the diffuse type. So we looked at the symptoms, and we wanted to see what symptoms were similar and what symptoms were different between the two populations. So we found out that patients who had abdominal pain were mo more likely to have Durkheim's disease. We also found that patients with easy bruising were more likely to have lipedema. And it's something that you think in your head, you know, yeah, there's a lot of women with lipedema who have easy bruising, and, it, and it's likely more common than Durkheim's disease, but nobody's ever tested that before, so now we know. And shortness of breath was more common in Durkheim's disease, and I was just talking to somebody about that tonight, and I'd really like to figure out why women with Durkheim's disease become short of breath, and nobody can figure out why. And then you were more likely to be able to see veins on your legs if you had lipedema. We also looked at, oh, actually, I think there's a cahoot to, to this one. Let's, let's uh, go to our cahoot and find out what kind of symptoms that this audience has and the audience out there. So I designed this to say you either have abdominal pain and shortness of breath or easy bruising and visible leg veins. Now you may not like this answer, but this is choose the best answer. Abdominal pain, shortness of breath, or easy bruising and visible veins on the legs. So more easy bruising and visible veins on the legs. And when we first looked at, to see what the majority of this audience was, we found it to be lipedema, and it correlates with these signs and symptoms. So we also looked at the the tissue, and we tried to figure out what areas of the body that we could pick out that would help us distinguish between lipedema and Durkheim's disease. And we found out that if we looked at the mid-back, now you remembered, um, or I'm sure many of you have, a pad of fat on the back. And we've been, if you were in the research study, we're taking your bra, we're opening up your bra and we're clamping on both sides of your back and then we're hooking your bra back up or, or we're lifting your sports bra up. Um, that part of the back is more likely affected if you have lipedema than if you have Durkheim's disease, which I find to be interesting. And so that's why we are measuring you today to see um, how much fat is there and um, it's a different way of measuring the amount of fat on the body and comparing the two populations rather than me just looking. We also found that the upper arms were more, more likely to be affected in lipedema. So the larger um, lobules on the arms more likely to be present with lipedema, and did we measure those today? Yes. We also found out that the buttocks were more, <laughs> more affected in, in lipedema, which everybody knows, right? In Durkheim's disease, there tends to be more fat on, in the abdomen and less fat on the legs, but nobody ever reported it, and now we have. And then we found out that in lipedema, you're more likely to have fat around the ankle than if you have Durkheim's disease. That's the lovely lipedema cuff. And then if you have lipedema, you're more likely to have a positive stemmer sign on the foot. That means that when you pinch up the skin on the foot, that you can't just, you, either you can't get it because it's so full of fluid, or when you pinch it up, you get fat and fluid and skin rather than just pinching up the skin. So you're more likely to have lymphedema or edema if you have lipedema. And that's the definition of the name. We also looked at different medical conditions between the two disorders. And let's see if I, yeah. So as I mentioned previously, if you have Durkheim's disease, you're more likely to have diabetes than if you have lipedema. So fat from the waist down is healthy, insulin-sensitive fat. And you can um, be a woman with stage three lipedema, and you can have perfect blood pressure, perfect cholesterol. You're at no risk for diabetes, and yet your doctor says you need to, you need to eat less and you need to exercise more. But if you have Durkheim's disease, the risk goes up. And if you are a woman with lipedema who develops obesity and you get the abdominal fat, then you too increase your risk for developing metabolic syndrome, which includes diabetes. We also found that if you have Durkheim's disease, you're more likely to have a, a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And whether you really have fibromyalgia or you just had Durkheim's disease or you have both, we really don't know. And it would be great to get a, 
a rheumatologist involved to help us figure that out. You're also more likely to have lipomas if you have Durkheim's disease. And you're more likely to have migraine headaches if you have Durkheim's disease. And migraine headaches are a vascular disorder. And there is one report of a woman with Durkheim's disease who has vasculitis, and she was um, from Italy. And there's other reports of there being white matter disease in the brain of patients with Durkheim's disease, and that suggests um, ischemia in the small blood vessels of the brain. What I also found interesting was that if you ask patients with lipidema and Durkheim's disease if they have fatigue or if they have swelling, it was similar between the two. So that was not very helpful in distinguishing the two disorders. And if we could go to uh, cahoots, I would like to know in this audience, do you have fatigue and do you have swelling? So do you have fatigue? Do you have swelling? Do you have fatigue and swelling? Or do you have none of the above? So it looks like the majority of people in this, this audience have both fatigue and swelling, which is, and that makes sense, because we have a, a mostly patients who have lipedema, but a good number with Durkheim's disease, and again, they're similar between the two, and, and we are proven correct in this audience. Yay. Can we go back to my presentation? So um, Karen and I came up with a, a pain score, or a, a scorecard, to help us differentiate between lipedema and Durkheim's disease. And we chose an average pain score of greater or, it's actually um, greater or equal to six, or um, then you're more likely to have Durkheim's disease, and it's less than six, you're more likely to have lipedema. Also, if you have Durkheim's disease, you're more likely to have abdominal pain, some cognitive dysfunction, so difficulty with word finding, difficulty with memory. You're more likely to have diabetes, fibromyalgia, lipomas, migraine headaches, and shortness of breath. If you have lipedema, you're more likely to have easy bruising. You're more likely to have fibrosis in your tissue, and we assess that today. And the most common places for fibrosis are low back and those hips, right? And then um, you can also have it on the cuff on the lower uh, part of the leg. Heavy tissue um, outside of the abdomen. So if you come to our research study, we will lift your boobs. I promise you. <laughs> but we also check the butt, and we flip the butt up and down. We check the thighs, and we check the hips. Um, also, if you have lipedema, you're more likely to have your hands affected. You're more likely to grow some lipedema fat on your hands and feet, and we saw that today. You're also more likely to have stemmer, positive stemmer sign and a risk for lymphedema, and you're more likely to have venous disease with visible varicose veins. One of the things I was interested in is, is do you have polycystic ovarian syndrome? Um, that's something that we have not been able to figure out, um, whether it's um, common in either population, so I thought tonight we would find out, do you have PCOS, yes or no? Okay, and we didn't really have enough time for that question, but polycystic ovarian syndrome um, is, occurs in about 10% of the population. If you get polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS and you have lipedema or Durkheim's disease, you are going to be worse. And the reason for that is if you have PCOS, you're insulin resistant. So you're at great risk for diabetes, hypertension, you have high androgen levels, you get abdominal obesity, you get acne, you get excess facial hair. So um, hopefully, um, maybe we'll uh, put a, a survey monkey out and we'll uh, find out about your two buttocks, we don't wanna miss that, and we'll find out about PCOS. You know, is it, is it occurring 10% um, uh, in, in our population of lipedema and Durkheim's disease as in the general population, or is it more or less? Um, but I, I do know that if you have PCOS, even though it's really important to treat the lipedema and the Durkheim's disease, it's super important to treat that PCOS and, and get, uh, improve your insulin sensitivity. So um, we can go back and finish the rest of the Kahoot questions if we can, and then I'll conclude. So next. Oh, here he is. How many of you have one buttock larger than the other? Woohoo! Come on, you guys, answer, answer, answer. Yes or no? Yes or no? Keep coming, everyone out there. Keep coming. Even if you're a man, go ahead.
No. So there's a few of you out there. I want to see all 12 of you tomorrow. <laughs> Can we go to the next question? How are your veins? Do you not have any vein problems? Do you have enlarged dilated veins or varicose veins? Do you have venous insufficiency or do you have spider veins? This is a really important question, and, and we really think that venous disease um, plays an integral role in lipedema. Not saying 100%, but definitely in a large number of women. Okay, so it's kind of variable. Um, some have no vein problems, some have enlarged veins, Th those are about equal. But a lot of um, women have venous insufficiency and a lot of women have spider veins. So I think um, if you have lipedema, you need to pay attention to your veins. And, I, and it's my opinion that if you're a woman with lipedema or Durkheim's disease, you should have a venous duplex ultrasound and you should get your veins looked at to make sure you, you have a problem or not. And if you have a problem, I would not jump to fix it right away unless it's very severe. Because um, basically to fix it, they can do a number of different things and we've got you know, vascular surgeons in our audience and you can talk to them more about it, but they're gonna close off that vein, which is gonna put pressure on your other veins. And we've had some uh, ladies who have developed lymphedema after a venous procedure. So I would be very, very careful about your veins and I would get very educated about it and I think we need to have some research studies on the veins uh, so that we can make it safe for women to get their veins treated when they have lipedema and Durkheim's disease. Next question. Okay, everyone who came into my research study today looked at their hands. Put up your, your dominant hand and tell me if your index finger is longer. That's your, your pointer finger. If your ring finger is longer or if they're equal in size. Which one is it? Index finger, which is your pointer finger, your ring finger, or are they equal in size? And by the way, that's my hand. Oh. So, uh, ring finger um, longer is the most common. Um, index longer was um, the well, third place, and fingers equal in size. So, why do I ask this question? The reason is because there's some literature out there that shows if you're ring finger is longer than your index finger, you've been exposed to androgens in your lifetime. And there's some genes that we don't look at a lot, and we probably should, and we probably will in the future, that can androgenize you. We feel that women who have lipedema tend to be estrogenized, and maybe women with Durkheim's disease are a little bit more androgenized, and that may be a way we can tell the difference between the two. And we saw a lot of women today who had either a longer index finger, so more estrogen, or they, uh, the fingers were uh, equal between the two. Next question. What is your average daily pain score? Just curious, so zero is no hurt, 10 it hurts the worst it's ever hurt, and you're about ready to call 911. And then just look at the smiley faces. Five is about average. What is your average pain score? One to three, four to six, seven to 10, or no pain at all? Okay, so the majority in this room are at a pain scale of, of four to six and seven to 10. So that's who you're sitting amongst. There's, there's a lot of pain in this audience, and that's why we're here, because it's our wish for you that you have no pain. Next, right? No pain. We gotta figure this out. Next, what type of food do you eat? So we're gonna hear about um, the ketogenic diet during this conference. That's my nephew <clears throat> eating cream, which is on the ketogenic diet. Um, there's a, and Leslyn Keith is gonna talk about the ketogenic diet. So what do you eat? And the, I know these aren't the best choices because the list would probably be this long to accommodate everyone, but more plant-based, more ketogenic, or just a healthy mix of the two, or some other. Ah, so it looks like um, the majority is eating kind of a healthy mixed meat and vegetable diet. Um, quite a few people are eating something else. We don't know what that is. <laughs> and it's growing. <laughs> and we've got um, a smaller number of ketogenic diet and a smaller number of plant-based diet. And the similarity between the ketogenic diet and a plant-based diet is that there are no carbs on there. So I'm hearing that we have a carb-loving audience here. And we know that carbs fuel fat. So a pasta fuels fat, 
bread feels fat, any kind of processed um, flour, I don't care if it's a um, gluten-free, double-sifted um, almond flour, it's still a grain, it's still a carb. So um, I'll, I'll be very interested to, um, to hear what you all think about the uh, ketogenic diet um, later on, or tomorrow. Uh, next. And so um, if if you had the opportunity to have an injection into your fat that's going to cause some itching, burning, and redness, where would you rather have it? Do you want it on that medial knee fat pad, or do you want it on your ankle cuff? You can only get rid of one, and you're going to have some side effects from the injection, itching, burning, redness. Where do you want it? Medial knee or the ankle? Or neither? Or both? Inner knee. Really? Okay. That's interesting. And is that because it, it, it inhibits your ability to walk? Yeah, you think? Can someone raise their hand? Inability, if, any other reasons? Pain. pain, so that medial knee pain is pretty bad. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you very much, that's important for me to know that. So lipidema and Durkheim's disease are both diagnosed clinically, and we need more tools and a better understanding of the tissue in order to do a better job. We need new data on genetics, imaging, and physiology. And we know that obesity is common in both lipidema and Durkheim's disease, but especially lipidema, and that's something we need to fight. And we need to figure out how we can reduce the lipidema, because I think it, or the obesity, because I think if we do that, we would have a much easier time differentiating between lipidema and Durkheim's disease. And there are a few signs and symptoms that you can use and you can take to your doctor even. You can take that paper and in that paper is that chart to help your doctor and you figure out whether you have lipidema or Durkheim's disease. So thank you very much. And remember, you are beautiful.